So welcome to class once again. So for this particular course, our learning objective is um, there are just three things. We'll learn what employee relations is. That's one. Okay? And uh, we'll learn um, the forms of employee relationships we have in the workplace. And lastly, your roles as HR practitioners in making sure we have the best of employee relations. That's the mutual investment employee relations. Okay? All right, uh, we're, we're, um, the class is kind of getting too dull, though we have only 25 minutes, but we should make it very interactive. So I'm going to ask a question now. What do you think employee relations is? What do you think? We are all in one relationship or the other. We are, yes, if it's not with the opposite sex, maybe boys, she is following a boy or he's following a girl. We have siblings, we have relationships with them. We have neighbors, one relationship or the other. So, what do you think employee relations is? Auntie. No, just say anything. Management of, management of employee in organization, relationship with them, communication with them, and all of that. Okay. Okay. All right. Is offering. Right. Be able to understand and interpret their emotions. Okay. That's something. Anyone else wants to give it a shot? Okay, um, please. Okay. Problems. Solving problems yes. in the workplace, okay. She's offering to say something too. Um, I think relations. Okay. Between employees. And that's where it ends. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, see, employee relations. Don't be gimmick. By the fact that it's saying, it's saying just employee relations, it doesn't stop with employees alone. It's that relationship that occurs in the workplace between employer, employees, that leads to something. It's not, it's not just that um, you are having a relationship with an hand. So it is whatever relationship you are having with your um, employees, that's now I'm talking about the employer, that you're having with your employees, that leads to at least three things productivity. We know come Lagos, come Cambridge. It has to lead to somewhere, right? Uh, motivation. Are people happy doing their jobs? Nobody likes to work. If you ask me, I think I want to be a housewife with a very rich husband. <laughs> and um, thirdly, it has to lead to heightened morale. That's everywhere should be sound. Let's look at um, how we defined it here. We say employee relations refers to an organization's effort to create and maintain a positive relationship with its employees that contributes to satisfactory productivity, motivation, and morale. Do we understand? So what this is saying essentially is that um, if we want to say we have any employee relationships going on in our organization, or we have any relationship at all going on between employers and employees that cannot be traced to these three things, then we are not having anything. Let me give you an example. I used to work in an organization where the ogre was so fine. <laughs> the ogre was so fine, even the boys, oh, of, of course, ogre is a guy now, right? You know, even the boys know that ogre is fine. So you can imagine just how fine he is. And because he's a guy, he has other things girls like. What is that thing? Thank you. <laughs> we all love it, yeah? Money. So this guy is not only fine, he has power, he's a guy, right? And then he has money. So imagine if we all decide to have a relationship with him and it's not going anywhere. It has no reflection on the business itself. Then we're just having relationship. Not employee relations. So you, as HR leaders or HR practitioners, I know this is the status class. This is what you should strive to understand eventually. Okay? So um, look at what uh, Zig Ziglar said there. Zig Ziglar was huge till his demise. He lived to be um, 86. And he was not only the best salesman that ever walked the planet, he was a wonderful motivational speaker and a huge author, like a great author. So he said, 
People often say that motivation doesn't last, right? Because human needs are insatiable. Today I want this. This is what is motivating me today. Tomorrow it might change. I'm a young lady right now. Maybe um, if you give me um, lunch as an incentive, as a benefit, that might do it for me now. But tomorrow if I have children, maybe crutch will do it, you know? That means lunch is no longer doing it for me. I want something else. And it doesn't stop there. We keep wanting more and more and more. So he says, people often say that motivation doesn't last, which is true. And then he says, well, neither does baiting. Abby, we will back tomorrow. We will not go back. So he's saying, yeah, keep motivating them to do their job, if that is what it takes. Huh? So let's um, trace back um, employee relationship to what used to be obtainable back in the days. In the days of our mothers and the mothers before them, the relationship between employer and employee was, um, was very loyal. Remember, they used to like to get loan service award. Can you remember? They used to love to be paid gratuity. Can you remember? Like, I remember my own mother, she used to work with DHL. When she got this loan service award, all they gave her was um, plaque. They wrote loan service award there. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think um, maybe something, maybe something small, and she was happy. She left, she, she, the plaque was in our parlor. In fact, I'm sure it's still there, but I stopped saying it. She was happy. What she, that was, it was doing it for her. But now, please, Bikun, how, how long have you been working? Three. Three years. How many places have you worked? Just two. Uh, in three years, two places. By the time she gets to the fifth year, it's only God that will know then. That means we are no longer interested in sitting in a place to earn that loan service award if we're not happy there, right? So um, right nowadays, it's more um, a contract-like economic exchange. Rob my back, I rob yours. What's the need for me? The same way when you go for interviews that they would ask you, what are you bringing to the table? You do you want to know well, how much are they paying there? What are they giving them there, you know? Employee value per um, perception. Like, ah, oh, I heard they are recruiting in a Chevron. Oh, Lord. How much are they paying there? You want to know? What do, they, what, what do people, um, their staff, you know, stand to earn? What do they stand to benefit by working with them? Let's take, for example, you know the word Otondo. You've heard the word before, right? It's kind of um, derogative for coppers. Sorry, auntie. <laughs> so if you see a company spring up today and they call themselves Otondo Limited, you might not be interested in them, right? But if tomorrow you walk by their office and you see some really sharp looking people, ladies and gentlemen, looking so on point, like, ah, ah this is their suit, no be small thing. This handbag, you know, you are even, you, we ladies, we know how to do this. You start measuring someone. Like, I can tell how much you're worth by just looking at you. You can tell from the air that, ah, uh, ah, uh, that's my month's salary she's wearing. And she works with Otondo Limited. It doesn't end there. The next day you're passing, you see some G-Wagon, you know, drive by in droves. And they have Otondo Limited carved on it. Uh-huh. They are getting your attention, right? It doesn't end there. And then the day after, you are, you are at home. You, you didn't even go anywhere. And then you see CNN, um, Hadvat. Otondo Limited is saying something there. The next time you see the Hadvat out, waiting go up on hands. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So they've gotten your attention. You are like, whoa, the branding is something I would like to identify with, right? Why? Is it because she wants to stay with them for so long and earn gratuity? No. It's because we know this thing, eh? You rub my back, I rub your back. It's an economic exchange. All right, so um, let's look at these two considerations. We know what a contract is, right? Yes, that's um, agreements between two parties or more. And um, once you, uh, it should have at least three elements in it. What should be the element? Should, there should be an offer, right? Yes, there should be an acceptance. And there should be consideration. That's, that consideration, that's the cocoa. There should be consideration for the offerer 
and there should be the uh, um, consideration for the offeree or the person that will accept it. Both of them, something must be in it before they would agree. So here are two considerations, one for the employer, the other for the employee. Look at this expected contribution. Who do you think this would be for? The expected contribution. Who would benefit from this? Employer, that's correct. And who would bring it to the table? Yes. So when we sit, when you come for that interview and we interview you and we ask you, okay, what are you bringing to the table? This is what we're asking. What will be your expected contribution? What will you give to me? And then the other one, the offered inducement is coming, is of course the opposite. This is what the employee would get. This is what the employer would give. So that's I, uh, my salary, my uh, benefit, both financials, not financials, both direct, non-direct. Um, non All the things I get for working for you, those are my offered inducements. Do we understand? Okay. So um, let's quickly look at um, the um, this um, I have four quadrants. This depicts the kind of relationship, the kind of employee relationship that could exist in an organization. Before we dissect it, we should know that every organization can decide to have all these four or just have one or two. You can mix it. But let's quickly understand it. All right. Um, on the y-axis, we know the y-axis, right? And then the x-axis, like... Um, on this part, we have the offered inducement. You remember we said um, this is what the employer give, right? And then on this um, axis, on the x-axis, we have the expected contribution. We agree that this is what you, or them, as the employee, will bring to the table. And then we have some uh, metrics assigned to each um, of these um, axes to let us know just how much each is given, OK? So we can see one, two, three, four, and same on the other side. So we look at relationship one, the first one, quasi-spot contract. You see, this one is um, a form of um, employee relationship where we are not expecting so much from you. We self will not give you so much. You can see the numbers we use to decode it. Bring one, I'll give you one. Bring two, I'll give you two. Do you understand? It is clear cut. At the time where you are signing the contract, I am letting you know that, yes, hello, welcome on board. But I don't want so much from you. I don't want your commitment. Just give me what we have agreed on. Hmm? Examples of people who find here are who? Who do you think you will find here? Huh? Marketers. Ha! Ah. <laughs> Those who are very committed, they are the ones that are feeding your company, no? Cleaners. Oh, okay, what kind of cleaners are we talking about? Like in my company, our cleaner is very strategic. We take cleanliness very seriously. Like his target is there must be no time we don't have water in the toilet. So his job is cut out for him. So he's not a good example. Can we have someone else? Who? Concerges. 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 Okay. What, what do they do? They stand at the door welcoming customers. Okay. Like those bank people, right? Okay. Just open the door, close it. Open the door, close it. Okay. Once it's five, you go home, bar. All right. It's a good one. Any other one? Huh? Casual laborers. Yes. I want you to mount 10 blocks. Once you mount it, to be going, right? That's a good example as well. That means your job is caught up for you. I want you to do this much, do it and go. I don't expect any more from you. In fact, use coppers as example. Those are tundras. Do your bit and go, right? After one year, no problem, right? Sorry, auntie, I'm so sorry. So sorry. Ah, <laughs> huh? So that's that. The second one we have here is under investment. Oh, Lord, this is bad. But then look at what the economy is like. Depending on who is sitting on the table, uh, we'll agree on who it is bad for. I will give you, I'll pay you one, I expect three from you. Hmm? I'll pay you two, I expect four from you. That's the plight of like 90% of Nigerian workers. They just want to like, you know, just bite off your head for giving you peanuts. Right? May God help us. 
Yeah. So for these people, um, employers love to be in this um, quadrant because um, it means um, they are able to cut cost. It's not easy to run a business in this country because um, your overhead, your OPEX, your OPEX, um, CAPEX, whoa. But it's not a good place to be for you as an employee, right? Let's look at the third one. This one is called overinvestment. Lordy, lordy, I'd love to be there. <laughs> Who else would love to be there? <laughs> You'd love to be there. <laughs> no. Can you see? But you see, that, um, that's how it is. Depending on who's on which side of the table, we'll say, okay, that overinvestment. As a matter of fact, if this is not being recorded, I'd love to be there. Let me just do this more and collect plenty. In fact, when you wake up in the morning, you have a way of praying and say, Lord, I am stepping out of my house today. Let me do small work, collect big money, beacon, right? We've prayed it before. But by the time we turn, the table turns and we we'll become employers, we won't want to pray such prayers. How can you contribute up to four, three, four, and then the person is only giving you one, two in return? That's bad, bad, bad business. So let's go to the fourth quadrant, the mutual investment. Now, this is the best one. This is the best form of relationship that can occur in a workplace. This is where nobody is getting cheated. This is where you have successfully created a win-win. Now I'm giving you three, four. You are contributing three, four. Now for this particular um, quadrant, employee is committed. You don't have to be policing them to say, what have you done today before they do their job? They are happy working for you. Uh, there's this debate in the HR space. They say um, engaged employees versus, um, what's the other one? Satisfied employee, choose one. Engaged employee might ne not necessarily be satisfied, you know? They will walk like your cars. Like, in fact, she five is five, right? Uh, they are still there, seven o'clock, call them. You think they used to walk to swear for them. They're still there. But it doesn't mean they're satisfied. The next minute they see something offering them anything better, boom, they're gone. What about the satisfied ones? Them plenty for uh, government worker now, <laughs> agency, local government. They're not going anywhere. They will not resign. They resign. Well. They will be there. They're satisfied working there. So salary comes when it should come. They're getting benefits. They have, um, what's that? Ah, uh, what's that that we used to call it? Oh, job, what? Job security. Thank you, job security. So they're fine. They're fine. But they are not engaged. They are the ones that, when you go to their office, <laughs> I, have, I had an experience one time like that. She said she wants to eat. Now, auntie, you know we Yoruba, we have a way of stressing all this age, E, I want to eat her. Go sit down. And I had to sit down. It's her office. She's being paid to do her job. But she's like, no. I'm not attending to you at this time. Go and sit down. I didn't have any choice. I had to sit, right? Do you want, if it were to be a private um, enterprise, would you like to have anybody like that working for you? No. So by the time you get to that, um, that fourth quadrant, that mutual investment, that means you have, in fact, not only broken even, you've made profit. Your employees are not only satisfied, they're very engaged, right? So um, these are short explanations of um, what we've discussed that uh, for the quasi sport, employers are interested primarily in tax performance without requiring commitment from the employees to the overall success of the organization. Employees in turn undo their tax without commitment. Uh, somebody who said here yeah, that we pretend to work because they pretend to pay us. And God no go best. The person didn't name himself. Which is true. If they're not paying you well. She, even the Bible or the Quran, I'm sure it says somewhere that to whom much is given. Thank you. So um, the next one, we have underinvestment. 
Of course, when a firm offers a narrow set of inducements, but in return expect a broad set of contributions from employees, God forbid this part of um, this kind of, but it's our plight these days anyways. And then the overinvestment, ah, Lord. Overinvestment approach of ER arises when organization couple high or broad inducements with low or narrow expected contributions. How many of us have noticed if you are in a WhatsApp group with your guys, eh, or Facebook, they are always active. While you are sweating, doing here and there, you notice that, uh -uh. Once you do palm is Oga, you do palm is Oga. Oga is active on Facebook. But you, oh, don't worry, we'll be Oga one day and we too will do our own, right? Uh, uh, what would you say, yes, so? <laughs> you should not try to, you know, walk your organization towards that direction. Mm -hmm. All right, so the last one, which is the mutual investment is um, the goal of the uh, mutual investment here is to solicit a broader range of behaviors and stronger commitment from employees by offering a large number of inducements in exchange for significant employee contributions. We agree that this is the best, right? So let's look at... Okay, so let's look at... Um, this, um, the things you need to do, I have just seven of them. You as HR practitioners, you know you are going into this world and bless a company, right? And bless yourself in return. Remember what we said earlier? We said um, you're, you are representing the company 51% um, of the time, right? And employees 41% of the time. Yes. So the reason an employee is in an organization is because the organization is there in the first place, right? So if it's not there, then they won't be there. That's the employee will not be there. So in light of that, you as HR practitioners, you have to work towards strengthening the mutual investment and um, employee relations in your organization by doing these seven things. It's not limited to this, but um, you should start with this. So the first one, you should understand your business goals. It cannot be overstressed. My colleague Helio mentioned it, that well, what shall it profit you as HR? When you don't know anything that is happening in your organization, when they say, um, we all know that yes, a business is in um, existence because it wants to make profit. But then we've heard about um, break even points, right? You know, break even point. That's where your investment is equal to your um, returns, right? All right, let me not take you too far to economics. So if you make one error after that, we we'll say you have made profit, right? And if you make 10 billion after that, it's a profit. So why not try to get your organization to 10 billion instead of staying at one air? So you must understand what your organization goals is so you can communicate same and function well in your organization. So the second thing is um, you should have clear definition of performance standard in alignment to um, strategic goals. Your people must know what they are working towards, KPI, right? They must, because if we are working without directions, we'll just be working in silos. We must know what we are trying to achieve. Okay, are we trying to take, or take, take over Ikeja? Or we want to take over Nigeria? Or we want to take over Africa? Or even the world at large? If your target is the world, that means you will give the kind of, um, you bring on board the kind of um, talent that can that is fit for that. If it's a keja, haba bring coffers now. Sorry, Auntie. All right. Um, the third one is equitable um, the, um policy and procedure development. Yes, you see um what we were discussing earlier about some people saying oh HR people they are not um approachable. They seem um rude and all. Your life will be made a lot easier if you have clear court um policy in your organization. That way, it's policy that say it's now, not you. You will be able to have guidelines that guides what you actually dish out to your employees. If they know that um, they cannot have more than five days leave, nobody will come and meet you and say, I want six, right? It's already in policy before they start saying, ah, you're not approachable. So the next one is equitable implementation of set policy. This means that um, once you now have that policy, you should be able to follow it to the letter. 
such that the same measure you use for person A will be used for person B. By the time you start changing it because, oh, person A, maybe they are favor with you. Uh, you wanted to say something? A is, uh, is your personal person, so you won't be able to do what is not right. Thank you. We will not be having personal persons in HR because why? We have policies. We have policy. Yes. And then um, we have um, clear de design of organizational structure. We have to know our reporting line. Most people complain that my organization doesn't have structure. You have to work towards ensuring you have structure so that person who hey, will know who he's reporting to. You know, you know your chain of command, your reporting line. Huh? And then um, communication. You have to communicate responsibly. Very, very important. It is, in fact, this particular topic cannot be overflowed. You as HR, you really need to, because you set the tone from top down uh, about your style of communication in your organization. It is not from your mouth that they should hear that, ah, being boy in um, marketing department has HIV. You know, things that you have to be able to communicate responsibly. If you want to communicate something to someone, ah, uh, you should know you have several audiences. You should know it's not just that person. Ah, uh, there are several people you have to communicate to. Otherwise, you have, um, what, um, grapevine taking control of your communication in your organization, right? And then uh, we have the, okay, look at what somebody said there, that a memorandum is not written to inform the reader, but to protect your, the writer. What this means is that um, you should get very used to documentation. Oh, that cannot be overstressed. Thank God for HIRS now, that you don't have to be doing paperwork all the time. You should have documentation. Because of what? Litigation. You don't want trouble, right? So you should have good documentation. And lastly, we have um, quality of work-life balance. This is where you think about your employees' um, welfare. You think about their safety. You think about um, employee assistant program. This is where you think about um, their life, a balance, trying to strike a balance between their life and that work. Uh, several things you could do. Many companies are waking up to it now that... All of us might decide, okay, eight hours in a day, but your whole eight hours might start from two to plus eight. Huh? If you are a guy, maybe he likes to, to, you know, to work out in the night so he doesn't, he doesn't wake early. So you can decide to start your day by 10. JB is to come and do eight hours. You know, and so on and so forth. So many things to do there. So many things to learn in HR. So I will stop now so that um, someone else can come in and uh, you know, continue from here. But before I go, let me leave you with this. Huh? Don't organize for any other purpose than mutual benefit to the employer and the employee. This is not me that says so. It was said by Mark Hanner. Hmm? Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>